Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. And new at 6, it's a new bill that will keep San Antonio in the game for major events at the Alamo Dome and the Convention Center. State Senator Jose Menendez wrote and successfully passed the Senate bill in the legislature. It could lead to millions of dollars to upgrade and improve some of our biggest facilities. RJ Marquez on the impact that Menendez says this will have for future events in the Alamo City. San Antonio is set to get a big boost from a little known piece of legislation that will go into effect this September. Senate Bill 2220 is just really a tool, a, a financial tool that uh, the city of Dallas and Fort Worth have used to build new facilities to make them more competitive. State Senator Jose Menendez filed the bill that allows San Antonio to designate parts of the city as project finance zones. The city then gets state hotel taxes from those zones to help fund huge projects. A zone around the Alamo Dome and Convention Center could bring in an estimated $222 million for improvements. We could pursue 94 conferences that currently we're undersized for. And what do those 94 conferences mean in terms of revenue? They mean an additional $921 million and another additional 1.7 million visitors. David Gonzalez says Visit San Antonio testified in Austin to get the bill passed. So San Antonio needed to make sure that it had a level playing field and able to expand our conventions facilities and sports facilities, just like other cities have been able to using this type of funding method. Since 2018, the Henry V. Gonzalez Convention Center has missed out on more than $525 million because of its size. Now there are other larger shows not related necessarily to tourism, but related to other industries that we need to have a larger convention center to attract them. Menendez says he would like to see the convention center at about 200,000 square feet. If we could add convention space to the our exhibit hall, then we could fit in them here. We have enough hotel rooms. We got a, obviously a great airport, all the things we need, but we just didn't have enough exhibit room. RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. He shot a woman in the face at the Quarry Shopping Center. That then teenage carjacker was sentenced to 45 years in prison today. The now 20 year old Julio Cesar Rivera accused of five carjackings between October and November of 2021, including that final attempt in which he shot a woman in the face near the Whole Foods in Alamo Quarry Market. That woman, Alana Castaneda, already endured multiple surgeries. She has more to go. She was in court today when Judge Ron Ron Hell gave Rivera the maximum sentence, which she'd asked for. I mean, it has changed my life um, completely. Uh, I have never experienced so much pain. There's obstacles that I never knew I'd ever face. And this is going to be with me for the rest of my life. Rivera took a deal with prosecutors to plead guilty to only three of those cases, which lowered his potential prison time. He is unable, though, to appeal today's sentence. The trial for the singer of a local Tejano band getting underway today. 43 year old Jesse Farias of La Tropa F.A. is facing a sexual assault charge, according to online records. Allegations brought against Farias in 2021 by a teenage girl who claimed he touched her inappropriately. If found guilty, he faces up to 20 years in prison. San Antonio police searching for a robbery suspect who may have been shot by a convenience store clerk he was trying to rob. It happened after midnight in the 800 block of San Pedro, San Pedro, just north of downtown. Officers say the suspect walked into the 7-Eleven brandishing a gun and demanded money. That's when the clerk reportedly managed to get his own gun and exchanged gunfire with that suspect. The employee told police he thought he shot the suspect, but the man ran away. The clerk was not hurt. There was one confirmed injury, though, a customer whose leg was grazed by a bullet. He's going to be OK. Police have not located the suspect yet. San Antonio police also looking for answers after an overnight stabbing on the city's west side. It left a woman with life threatening injuries. Officers called to Riva Street near General McMullen. We're told the victim knocked on someone's door looking for help after she'd been stabbed. She was taken to University Hospital. No word on a possible suspect or a possible motive. New at six, no escaping the heat. That's how some people living in older homes feel. Some older San Antonio homes will never cool down, even with the AC cranked all the way up. It's because they aren't properly weatherized. Our Camelia Juarez tells us about a free program that is slashing energy bills and bringing relief to some homeowners. 88-year-old Adolph Zimmerman says he would leave the AC on, use blinds and fans, but his house stayed miserably hot. He come in here so real strong, but, but now the heat doesn't come through the wall at all. 
It wasn't until ACOG or the Alamo Area Council of Governments brought the temperature down in Zimmerman's house for free. Well, what we try to do is come into each house and reduce the amount of air infiltration by about 50 to 75 percent. And again, that'll just stop that outside hot air from coming in the house. ACOG inspector Andre Furman says he did this by installing an energy efficient air conditioner and adding insulation throughout the house, especially in the attic. If you don't have insulation, it's 100 degrees outside and you're trying to get it 78 in here, it, that AC is going to work forever and still probably never satisfy the temperature. ACOG just received additional funding from the Department of Energy so that they can provide more energy saving resources like these solar screens. Brightness coming in, it just shuts it all, goes the other way. So it's a big, it helped a lot, those fancy screens, whatever you want to call them. The free weatherization assistance program is designed to help low income individuals that qualify overcome high energy costs. According to Zimmerman, his electric bill was cut in half and his house feels like home again. He doesn't come through the wall at all. So it's much, it's, it's fabulous. Camelia Juarez, Kisa 12 News. I like stories like that. Me too. Happy endings. Mm -hmm. All right, live look outside 103 degrees out there. I mean, the heat affecting us all in different ways right now, Adam. Yeah, and actually we tied a record high today, 105, the high temperature this afternoon. That's 10 degrees above average, and that ties the record, which was set back in 2020. Notice that morning low of 80. I was looking back at the records, and we haven't been below 80 degrees since Tuesday morning, a little before 8 o'clock a.m. It's been a while. High temperatures today, Pleasanton, 103, Carrizo Springs, and Del Rio, 108 106 in New Braunfels, uh, we know the drill. It's more of the same, and this is going to continue into the upcoming weekend. You're going to feel that heat still in place. Very humid this evening. The dew points are going to rise again. It's going to be very sticky, but at least we'll have a bit of a breeze out of the southeast at 15 to 20 miles per hour. Notice at 8 o'clock, 98, 10 o'clock at 90 by midnight. We're down to 84 and we'll start the day tomorrow right near 80 record breaking heat, I think is likely in the days ahead. We'll talk about which days will have a record high temperature and where the heat high is going to center and what that means for some all time records in just a bit. There are some big weekend closures to be on the lookout for, especially if you travel right over here to Loop 1604 on the north, on the north side. Pardon me. That's due to an expansion project that we have taking place. Now, this is a full weekend closure. As I mentioned, it's going to start around Northwest Military Highway and finish up around Stone Oak Parkway, but it's going to impact both the east and westbound lanes. Let's show you what's taking place out there. There is bridge work that is happening. It all begins Friday, July 14th and wraps Monday, July 17th. So let's see what's in store for those east eastbound lanes from Bitters Road. We'll see an exit ramp closure to the Blanco Road entrance ramp. Now keep this in mind. Those closures are going to stay in place for the entire duration of the weekend. So watch out there. Now as for the westbound lanes, as we take a jump over here, it's going to be the same thing. It all wraps up on Monday, July 17th. Work should finish at five in the morning, but we're going to see that full closure of the westbound main lanes from the Blanco Road exit ramp to the Blanco Road entrance ramp. Now these lane closures will again remain in place for the entire duration. This is just a portion of what's taking place this weekend. What I want you to do now is scan this QR code. It's going to take you to our KSAT traffic page, and there is a full list of all the closures that are happening this weekend and into the early days of next week. But again, that full closure is going to impact a lot of people. So make sure to start planning ahead. Look for some alternative routes. Always good to know what to expect before you have to hit the ropes. All right, I'll show you what's going on right now on our roadways. This is Loop 410 at San Pedro, and you can see a couple of vehicles who are pulled over to the side. It's the westbound lanes of 410. Police are already on the scene. I don't know if it's an accident or just a disabled vehicle, but again, it's 410 and San Pedro, the westbound lanes. Bit of a slowdown there as they try to get those cars off the road there. Well, new at six, tears of joy for a Lacoste woman after an act of compassion and support. Jonathan Coto on an organization that gifted a newly remodeled mobile home to a widow whose home was falling apart, changing her life forever. This is my new bedroom. An incredible act of kindness has brought tremendous joy for Melissa Valderrama as she walks us through her newly remodeled mobile home. I think this is for the wash and the dryer. Wow, oh, heaven. It all began when the nonprofit Impact Cares arrived at Valderrama's doorstep. 
They're an organization that partners with local volunteers to improve the lives of people living in mobile home communities. My husband passed away about 10 years ago. I needed a lot, a lot of work, a lot of work. It, it couldn't be saved. Valderrama lived in this home for over 22 years. She says after her husband passed, the house just began to fall apart and she didn't have the means to make repairs. My doorknob broke and I haven't Googled how to put a new one. So I haven't had one in a while. I lock it in the inside. But having everything like new is just like a miracle. And for many years, she says she's lived without a washer, dryer, and even a stove. I've been looking at recipes that I want to make. And the other day I said, stop, Melissa, you don't have a stove. That's not going to happen. And now it is. Tori Wilson, a project manager with Impact Care, says they typically help people with repairs. But when they saw Balderrama's home, they realized some areas were just uninhabitable. So we started looking for a different home. We found one, got it, we remodeled it, um, painted it. You know, the inside, we, we went through the inside and put new flooring. The new home also giving her elderly dad a peace of mind. He's 84 and he always worries about me because I'm by myself. But now he doesn't have to. Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. Welcome home. All right, we're not the only ones dealing with the brutally hot summer. Our pets also feeling the heat. What vets are saying they're seeing during this sizzling stretch. It's up next. Here's what we're working on for you tonight on the night beat. A sister's plea for help more than four years after her brother's murder. The potential game changer that she hopes will help solve the crime. Plus, a community staple closing its doors. The problems putting the new Braunfels YMCA out of business and the frustrations for some members. It's all tonight on the Night Beat at 10. Everyone trying to deal with the heat this summer, but as ABC's Ginger Z shows us, as humans do their best to stay cool, it's easy to overlook another vulnerable population. Pets. Earth warmed to its highest temperatures ever recorded by human instruments this summer. And as human amplified, natural climate change is now making extreme heat more intense and more frequent. It's not just dangerous for humans, but also for pets. Since June, we noticed that we received about 243 heat distress related calls. Um, and that's a significantly higher number than we saw at this time last year. In peak afternoon hours, officials in Texas were called to treat a small dog for heat stroke. The dog was wearing a sweater in 106 degree heat. They also rescued several dogs who had been left outdoors in kennels in direct sunlight. Temperatures there were baking above 110. The dogs were immediately treated with cooling baths to lower their body temperatures. If you're concerned about your pet experiencing heat distress, you may notice that one of the things that they do is they start to pant heavier than they normally would. But if you're noticing that the panting is becoming labored, Maybe the pet is laying down on his or her side, not wanting to be active anymore. And in worst cases, sometimes they develop vomiting and diarrhea as relate to heat distress. To help protect against the heat, keep your pets well hydrated. Make sure that they've got plenty of shade or cool places to stay. And be aware of not over-exercising pets outdoors when it's hot. I'm Ginger Z. Yeah, remember those pets. You know, don't if you put them outside, you forget about them. Remember the pets. Get, make sure they have plenty of water. Yeah, plenty of water and shade, and uh, if you can, just a fan or something to even yeah. help out. Yeah, I, I noticed. Uh, so I was playing darts with my friend last night, right? Really? Yeah. <laughs> Shocking, right? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> In the garage, Cody and I are playing darts. I, I thought and you it, did that every night. No, not every night. Okay. Right. And uh, his little dog Dixie came over, and Dixie was fine in front of the fan, just fine. You know, a big yep. floor fan going, and that's where Dixie wanted to hang out. There you go. Makes sense. All right, let's talk temperatures and what we can expect in the days ahead. More triple digit heat, not just triple digit heat, but we're talking record breaking high temperatures for a few days. And we'll get to that in a moment in the seven day. But notice tomorrow back up around 104. Maybe we'll get a one degree break on Sunday of 100, 103. Then we're back up to 105 early next week. Heat index probably between 105 and 110 for most of us during the 
afternoon hours. Right now, 103 feels like it's 105. We're starting to finally see those dew points drop down a little bit in the afternoons, mixing downward some drier air mixing in. And so that's mitigating the heat index during the hottest part of the day, at least a little bit. So feeling like up 105, but I do think uh, as a rule of thumb, you can add about three to seven degrees to the air temperature at any time to get the feels like. Honda 103 right now, Bandera 102, Stinson on the south side, 104, Catula 106, and Del Rio at 107 or 107. Taking a look at the big picture and a good chunk of the state, triple digits right now. You go up to Lubbock, 100, Midland 104, Dallas 103, you get the idea. Phoenix 115 and Las Vegas 110. That's where the heat high is really starting to build. Now it's still influencing us and it's over us, but it's much stronger and really starting to build in over the Western US and California. And I talked about this a little bit yesterday, but as this high really presses down over the Western US, they're gonna be feeling the heat in the days ahead. Tomorrow, the forecast from the National Weather Service, Las Vegas, 116. Keep in mind, the hottest temperature ever recorded in Las Vegas is 117. We go into Sunday, Las Vegas is forecasting 118 for their high temperature, and that would be a new all-time record high for them. So that's the significance of the heat that they have out west. You know, coming up next uh, half hour at 645, we're actually going to look at a little area of cooler than average temperatures and where you need a plane ticket to get away from this heat. 100 degree, degree days now, we're at 20 so far this year. By this time last year, we were at 36, so a bit of a contrast. And last year was the hottest summer on record. Look at the satellite radar. There was more activity last night and even early this morning in parts of the panhandle of Texas and even Oklahoma and right along the Red River here. So some folks did get another little drink of water. They're fortunate. Now the severe weather is right up the plains, especially into parts of northern Oklahoma and southwestern Missouri there. And this is actually one part of Texas that's not drought stricken in the panhandle. And their potential for rain continues. Actually, it's looking decent over the next seven days. Notice how that basically area of rain stays to the north of us. Panhandle right along the Red River and other parts of the country, but not here over south or central Texas and not over the western US either with that big heat high we were talking about. So let's talk about tomorrow 79 at 7 AM by noon 95 degrees 104 tomorrow afternoon, but it's going to feel like it's around 109 for a brief period of time. Pool weather all weekend, and it's really just more of the same into Sunday. Sunny and hot, a southeasterly breeze at 5 to 15 miles per hour. Tomorrow in Catula, Carrizo Springs, even Crystal City, Dilly area, 107. Gonzales, 103. Canyon Lake, jump in the water, air temperature 102. I know the water level's uh, low. I want to say they're at about 75% uh, full right now. Anyway, Castroville 104 and Elmendorf as well. Record highs likely to be broken tomorrow. The record's 102. Saturday, Sunday, Tuesday, and Friday is when we're expecting the record high to be tied or broken in the days ahead. And yes, more darts tonight with the fan blast. Of course. Mm -hmm. Thank Just you. got new ones. All does right. That, does that mess up the direction of the dart if you get the fan blowing? Uh, it's, to, on our feet. it's down low. It's yeah. on our feet. Yeah, yep. they don't want to mess up, you know, they don't want to play the wind. Yeah. And it's yeah. behind us. Okay. Just, okay. That's what I'm told anyway. I've never been invited. Oh, no. All right, so <laughs> wow. yeah, what, do we, right. what do we call these guys, David? Do you call them the French Connection, French Phenom, the E Brothers? The E Brothers. Oh, I kind of like that one. And CD? E? I kind of like that one. That's good. Like, kind of like the, the Bruise Brothers used we'll to go be. with that. That worked. Yeah. First, second pick in this year's draft. Ready. Already getting lofty comparisons, though, and it's not to another Frenchman either. And one on one with another one to San Antonio's own NFL playmaker. Coming up. Last year was comparing me to Gino Billy, and I said, okay, he's a good player, so I take it in other ways, you know. So not bad being compared to a oh, Hall of Famer, Manu Ginobili, but the rookie still knows he's a rookie in big board sport. Oh, you got it, kid. 
Spurs getting ready for another Vegas experience on the floor tonight against the Pistons. C.D. Sissico, one of those players who was looking for a spot on the big team roster. He was the Spurs' 44th pick in the draft this past April. Like Manu, he comes out of the second round. And like when Manu was a young Spur, C.D. is starting to find his way. I know, like, I'm a rookie, and I'm not getting, like, and I'm second round pick, so I, I know I will not get, like, 20 shots. So I'm just trying to do my best in defense and try to help the team in offense too. But no, I know my role. I know what to do in offense and defense. So I just keep practicing there. Greg Popper is told, told me, like, you yeah, just do your thing on defense. So I'm doing this. So, yeah. All right. You'll get to see CD take the field, take the, <laughs> take the field, take the court tonight, the Pistons and the Spurs in Vegas. Tip off 8 o'clock. We'll have some highlights for you coming up on the night beat. It is the unofficial official start to summer camp for college football. Two days of media. The Big 12 wrapped up yesterday. Texas, the pick to win the Big 12 this year before they ride off into the SEC, taking their Oklahoma buddies with them, including head coach Brent Venables, who grew up coaching in the Big 12 conference. What a, an amazing time it's been, you know, in this conference. And all of my opportunities in my life uh, that I have here as a coach you know, have all come from, you know, this conference, you know, the Big 8, the Big 12, the coaches, the great mentors that I've had and all the amazing players that have helped me had uh, a career of success. So uh, incredibly thankful, you know, for, uh, you know, this conference and what it's meant. And as we all know, this is a conference that uh, takes a backseat to nobody. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. It is a moment etched in the memories of former Judson and Texas A&M star DeMarvin Leal and his family. When he was drafted by the Pittsburgh Steelers last year, he is back in town this week to host a football camp for kids. Larry Ramirez had a chance to go one-on-one -on -one with the third pick in last year's, the third round pick in last year's NFL draft, starting with the adjustments he has to make now that he's moved to Pittsburgh. Dude, it was a big change for me, you know, just going from a new defense to a new city to, you know, first time being out of Texas, truly. And, you know, I just adjusted. felt like I adjusted well, got used to cold weather. So cold that I come back here and I'm just don't know what to do with this heat. So, you know, just there's a lot of trials and tribulations that I went through and just overcame and just ready to get back to get back up there and just thrive. Is there a moment from last season that you remember vividly when it's like, wow, I'm here in the NFL? Um, I would say training camp. Training camp definitely was different. Okay. My team loves to run a little bit old fashioned, going out there to, what is it, Latrobe? Latrobe yeah. And man, just being in a dorm, you know, I wasn't in a dorm in college. So okay. we are in the dorms over there. And then, you know, it's hot, it's rainy. It gives you everything all at once. And so it's just, uh, it was kind of like, dang, like I'm actually here. We were at your draft party. And the Steelers selected you. You still think about that day? Because it really wasn't that long ago. No, nah, it wasn't that long ago, but I definitely still think about that day. And it's, I don't think that's the day I'll ever be able to forget, honestly. I mean, who wouldn't? Because that's a dream from, that I had from when I was four years old. Once again, his camp is sold out, but you can go and watch at Judson High School tomorrow morning. Maybe see a few future stars like me out. I, when he was talking about the weather change, I cannot, I mean, yeah, yeah big imagine. change between here and Pittsburgh. Yeah, get out of, off the plane or out of your car, just like, boom. Hit with it. Blast me back to Pittsburgh. Yeah. Thanks, David. All right. All right, we're going to talk about the writers and actors strike in Hollywood when we come back. Lights out in Hollywood. The Screen Actors Guild's approximately 160,000 members are on strike, likely bringing production to a halt for some of your favorite TV shows and most anticipated movies. As Ivan Rodriguez reports, they are joining members of the Writers Union who've been striking since May. Actors hitting the picket line Friday going on strike against television shows and movie productions for the first time since 1980. We are being victimized by a very greedy entity. The sag after strike, crippling a TV and movie business, already limping during the Writers Guild of America strike. Both guilds are upset over compensation in the streaming era. There's a whole middle class of writers and actors that is disappearing because they're making it more and more difficult to just make a living. Along with better pay, 
Actors say residuals for past work have been dried up since the rise of streaming services. Concerns about artificial intelligence are another sticking point in negotiations. Studios say they've offered the highest percent increase in minimum pay in 35 years. There's a level of expectation that they have that is just not realistic. And they are adding to a set of challenges that this business is already facing. For viewers, the impacts on their screens could be felt by the end of the year. The movie production will shut down. TV productions have shut down. Many have already shut down because of the writer's strike. So we're going to see, you know, season premieres happening much later. I'm Ivan Rodriguez reporting. And as luck would have it, we are joined now by Washington Post features reporter Samantha Cherry about the actor and writer strike. Samantha, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I, and I want to talk about where we are in this strike. Do you see any hope that this is going to end anytime soon? So honestly, it is, you know, very up in the air on when this is going to end. If we look at some previous strikes, um, they've lasted um, some months long. Um, the last time the um, SAG and AFTRA went on strike together um, was in 2000, and it lasted about five months long, and it was one of the longest entertainment strikes in history. So it really is up in the air when this will end and when, um, you know, the actors will be able to make an agreement with studios. We just did a little story uh, on it that ABC had uh, about some of the things that are at play here. But when we talk about things like Netflix and Hulu and Amazon and even Apple, all of these streaming services that are out there and they're putting out their own movies. Is that at the heart of what this strike is about, that, the, that these uh, writers and, and actors in support of these writers are saying they're not getting compensated fairly for their work? That's correct. Yes. So in the streaming era, um, you know, the seasons are shorter and there's more, um, you know, less, there's more time where actors and writers aren't able to work. And so what they're really asking for is compensation that can match, um, you know, the more traditional era um, of TV and movies. Um, so at the heart of it is, you know, getting more compensation and also regulating the use of artificial intelligence um, so that they're able to, um, you know, continue and in this um, profession and continue to have it be sustainable. And when you say limit the use of artificial intelligence, Samantha, you're talking about basically having AI write scripts and do actors voices and things like that? Yes, things like that. So um, as the uh, contracts were before, they didn't really have any sort of regulations on how to um, basically use AI, whether it would be used for, um, you know, helping writers um, draft scripts or whether it would be used to um, have actors have their digital likeness be, you know, duplicated through artificial intelligence. Um, so um, both of the writers and actors unions um, are trying to work into the contract uh, so that, you know, there are ground rules set in place um, so that, you know, a lot of their concerns is that artificial intelligence will, you know, try to take over their jobs and um, or that studios will try to use it to kind of cut costs um, in using that over their own artistry. You know, Samantha, I've read some of the articles that you've done and some of your colleagues at The Washington Post, and I saw that uh, a lot of these big studio heads like Bob Iger that you just heard, who's the head of Disney, which owns ABC, which is our affiliate here at KSAT 12, has said we've given the biggest raise that uh, writers have ever been, we've offered that, the biggest raise that writers have ever been offered in the history, uh, and that's not enough. Is that what it seems on the surface, or, I mean, it, is that kind of couched in different ways when you talk about a big raise that's been offered? So, um, you know, from uh, the writers and actors' perspective, what they're saying is that, it's not enough because um, because of how um, you know short their work time has become, um, and then having to make that money kind of stretch thin in terms of you know paying for like their insurance and um, you know the other costs that come in terms of like you know paying their publicist, and so from their perspective, they're saying that you know they need these raises to be more um, to 
be able to account for things like inflation and, um, you know, having these, uh, you know, shorter term, you know, gig type work that they've been doing. I saw that some of the actors uh, that were actually on the red carpet, I think it was the premiere of Oppenheimer or something that was that was playing, left the red carpet immediately to join the actor's strike, the writer's strike. Does this change the game, having the actors join the writers in this whole thing? Absolutely. Um, so with the writer's strike, which has been going on since the beginning of May, um, you know, the actors were still able to work with, um, you know, whatever pre-written scripts were made in production, but without actors, um, any, you know, television show or movie that was currently filming, you know, with any sort of scripted program, um, you know, they now don't have any performers to even do what it was left of the script. So um, this effectively has, you know, shut down most of the entertainment industry. Um, and so, you know, with this, we'll really see um, more of a delay in, you know, depending on where different productions are um, in terms of when they actually do premiere. Last question for you, Samantha, before we let you go. I know it's a Friday. You have big plans. I appreciate you joining us. But let's talk about what this means. What has to happen before something changes in this whole thing? Is Netflix or Hulu or Amazon, do they have to see subscribers go away before they move on this whole thing? Yes. So um, one thing that is interesting that's different from this strike versus previous strikes um, is that, you know, we do have like these very um, big studios. Um, they, you know, have revenue coming in from many different places. Um, so they can kind of hold on a little bit longer in terms of, um, you know, still having revenue coming in um, without having to rely on the work of actors and writers. Um, but, you know, in the months to come, um, they will start seeing um, the pinch in their profits. And, you know, maybe that will make them more amenable to um, kind of, uh, you know, seeing the writers and actors demand. So, um, you know, when that exactly will be is really up in the air. Um, but, you know, it'll just be, um, you know, in months to come, just like monitoring it and seeing how the negotiations will go. Yeah. Meanwhile, the studios are banking on the writers running out of money in this strike and not working. So it's it's a back and forth. Samantha Cherry with the Washington Post. She's the features reporter, great writer uh, that I have read on uh, following some of this and the ins and outs and just what it means for all of us. Samantha, thank you for your time. Thank you. We'll be right back.